Howdy folks, Jamboriki here. In today's video, I'm going to be ranking animated movies that came out in 2022. A few things that you should know before we begin though. 1. If I don't include a certain movie, I've not forgot about it. It's either because it's not out in the UK yet, it was technically first released in 2021, or I simply didn't get time to see it. 2. I won't be including live action slash animation hybrid movies. With all that said, let's get ranking. Marmaduke. Marmaduke is a badly behaved dog who is driving his owners crazy, so a famous dog trainer called Guy offers to whip Marmaduke into a champion. Marmaduke passes the training with flying colours, but once he enters a dog show, another contestant encourages him to eat a banquet, which causes Marmaduke to be overstuffed and flatulent, becoming so desperate to release himself that he craps in the trophy cup. This accident brings shame and dishonour to Marmaduke and his family, so Marmaduke convinces Guy to give him another chance, and the Great Dane goes up against the best of the best dogs to win back public approval. The most glaring problem with this movie is that it's hideously ugly. Look, I'm all for stylistic animation and unique designs, but this movie is an example of over -stylization. Every character is horrible on the eyes, and the proportions are off-puttingly creepy. The cherry on top of the terrible look of the film has to be the disgusting gross-out comedy the movie relies on. The whole bloated and farty Marmaduke scene alone is full of ghastly imagery that made me feel nauseous. Uh-oh! What are you doing? But the film doesn't just make me want to bleach my eyes. The script is also a bottom-of-the-barrel awful dumpster fire. Most of the movie fishes for humour and drama by tormenting, torturing and embarrassing Marmaduke. Don't get me wrong, he's a badly behaved dog with an obnoxious personality, but the way humans treat him is undeservedly nasty. One scene we're watching Guy making him suffer in the name of training, <laughs> then the next scene the family is bullying him for ruining their reputation. I wouldn't even say that Marmaduke is completely to blame for what happened. A veteran dog show performer gave him advice on contest eating habits, and Marmaduke naively listened. We're not supposed to eat a large meal before a competition. A large meal before a competition is exactly what you need. If anything, Marmaduke was taken advantage of. This film is a totally irredeemable and insultingly awful animated disaster, that shoves a middle finger at kids' intelligence and dignity, hence why it's at the very, very bottom of my list. Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Roderick Rules In the sequel to last year's animated Wimpy Kid movie, Greg's parents are leaving the boys alone at home, so Greg, his brother Roderick, and best friend Rowley set up a cool party for big kids, but Roderick betrays them by locking them in the basement. In revenge, Greg takes pictures of the party through a keyhole, and bribes Roderick into sharing advice on getting popular. There's very little I can even say about this turd of a movie, because it's just an hour of dysfunctional brothers being toxic and manipulative towards each other. There's not really a story, stuff just happens. The brothers don't naturally grow or learn to bond as the movie goes on. They just keep up their blackmailed friendship, then randomly turn on each other in nasty ways now and again. The movie tries to crowbar in this emotional plotline about the brothers growing apart, and we do get an apology scene right at the end of the film. But the movie never earns these dramatic beats, because it's way more interested in ramping up every revenge scheme or prank. Any attempt at sincerity feels tagged on. I can't even say that it's funny enough to make up for its mean spirit, because the comedy is basically cringe without any of the humour. Say, boy, so small? Oh, baby, dumb! We see you in there, boy, size small. We're gonna hand you over to the authorities. Even the parents are terrible. You'd think that they'd be the voices of reason in all this, but they're useless at best and extreme at worst. Like, when Roderick's party's exposed, they decide to punish him by forcing him not to play drums at his band's next gig, but he's still allowed to see the gig and learns that he's been kicked out. Yet he deserves a punishment, but Roderick is an uneducated couch potato. Drumming is the one thing that he shows potential at, so the parents taking that away from him is cruel and non-constructive. The parents never step in between the brothers, either. Sure, they express private concern. Look, sometimes my older brother Joe would string me along, and then I'd get burned. Greg needs to protect himself. But none of them ever sit down to chat with either of them. So in a way, the parents are partly to blame for the boys' antics getting out of hand. Last year's Wimpy Kid movie wasn't great, but the sequel makes it look like Citizen Kane. Kids deserve so much better than irresponsible and lazy films like this. 
the Ice Age adventures of Bug Wild. Crash and Eddie have a habit of doing reckless things, which really annoys their herd. However, their sister Ellie insists that they should stay in the family, because they lack independence. So Crash and Eddie leave their herd behind to prove themselves, fall into the lost world, and meet Buck Wild again. Unfortunately, a big brain villain called Orson is on the rise. So the possums, Buck, and Buck's ex superhero partner Z join forces to stop this evil dinosaur. This sequel isn't just an insult to Blue Sky Studios' legacy, it's also the worst Ice Age movie to date. Yes, even worse than Collision Course. It follows a very basic template of heroes learning to be courageous while they go up against a tyrannical villain bent on domination, which has been the premise for a lot of classic animated films. But this movie doesn't exactly do anything special with that template, just the bare minimum. I mean, a prehistoric villain who wants to wipe out all mammals in a dinosaur world is a unique concept for an antagonist. But all Orson ever does is chase our heroes around with dumb raptor minions following him, a monologue about how amazing he is. The joke's on you! My brain, the thing that everyone ridiculed, is the one thing that's gonna get me my revenge! Even though Buck's name is in the film's title, he's not really the star. This is Crash and Eddie's story, a goofball duo who work best as comic relief supporting characters, and just end up being obnoxiously annoying as lead heroes. Sure, they become braver characters by the film's end, but they never grow up or mature. Or while Buck himself is mainly left to do his usual crazy man shtick. You remember my daughter? Bronwyn! She's gotten so big and round and... big? Sure, Bug gets to reunite with his fellow superhero Z, but all these two ever do is argue and bicker. They're so aggressive to each other that I failed to buy that they've even had a history of friendship. You're irresponsible. Thick-headed! You're demanding! I'm and you're tired always being mean to me! Back when Orson set that look, trap for me, she and I survived, but the rest of the team didn't! We needed to have a strategy! Your way didn't work! It doesn't help that Z is just a stock action heroine who is only here to babysit the man-child characters. We're immune to sneak then. Yeah, but I'm not! It would kill me! It would make me break out. And then kill me. The animation is also a noticeable downgrade from previous Ice Age movies. Say what you will about Blue Sky's Ice Age sequels, but at least the animation always looked like it was improving on every release. Buck Wild's animation is very restrained and robotic, which makes for hollow emotional scenes and embarrassingly sloppy fight sequences. Time to get a little less mammoth and a little more pasta. This straight to Disney Plus sequel is just babysitter fodder to keep kids quiet for 90 minutes. It only exists to expand the Disney Plus library and nothing more. Hotel Transylvania Transformania. It's the 125th anniversary of Hotel Transylvania. At the celebration party, Drag plans to announce his retirement and that the hotel will be handed to Johnny and Mavis. Mavis finds this news out before Drag is about to go on stage and she tells Johnny to pretend that he doesn't know yet. However, Johnny gets overexcited and explodes with gratitude to Drag. Drag then realizes how awful it would be to let Johnny take charge of the hotel, so the Count lies that he can't pass the hotel on to a human, leaving Drag with no idea what to say once he goes on stage. Johnny wishes he was a monster, so Van Helsing introduces Johnny to a magic crystal that can turn anything into a beast, and the mad scientist tests it on a hamster. Van Helsing then uses the magic crystal to transform Johnny into a giant dragon. Drag discovers that Johnny is now a monster, so the Count desperately tries to turn Johnny back into a human before Mavis finds out, but Drag keeps missing Johnny, and he ends up morphing himself into a mortal. Van Helsing says that the crystal has run out of power, but he's tracked another crystal in a South American jungle, so Johnny and Drag head to South America to find the new transformation crystal and Drac insists that Johnny doesn't tell Mavis about what's happened. Meanwhile, Drac's friends end up drinking from a fountain that the magic crystal ray accidentally hit, and they all turn into humans. This film tries to use Johnny to tell a be yourself message, but it really messes it up, and just ends up saying you have to only look at a person's positives and ignore their flaws, or you're a cranky person. There's embracing someone for who they are, and then there's acting like people can't break out of bad habits. Johnny may be a friendly guy, but he lacks self-control and social etiquette. Sure, Drag handles rejecting Johnny pretty badly, but he's not a bad person for thinking that Johnny isn't mature enough to run his hotel. The film is also a boringly straightforward point A to point B journey through a plain vanilla jungle, with the same repeated jokes of human Drag suffering from mortal pain and Johnny being cheerfully optimistic as a monster. Being a monster is super weird. Ah, uh, yeah. But being a human is the worst. The whole Drax friends turning into humans plot is very uninspired too. Once you've seen these monsters as mortals, the novelty and humor is already dead. Because it's just the same jokes all the way through the film. Rinse and repeat. 
Total Transylvania 4 was supposed to be the final entry in the series, but it all ends with a whimper rather than a bang. The Soccer Football Movie When a bunch of kids sneak into a football stadium, they bump into soccer star Zlatan. The children show off their footballing skills to him, and introduce themselves as the Creature Catchers, a team of junior paranormal monster hunters. Zlatan, impressed, offers them free all-star cup tickets. Unfortunately, while Zlatan is looking for the tickets in his changing room, a mind slug takes over his body, and he becomes an evil mutant. So the Creature Catchers have to track down Zlatan and find a way to turn him back to normal. We then learn that comedian Weird Al is the one behind these slugs. You see, he plans to steal talents from a bunch of football stars so that he can win the all-star cup himself. Based on the description I just gave, I bet you're completely baffled that this movie even exists. Well, it's real and it's as strange as it sounds. Plus, it gets even weirder as it goes on. From the reveal that Whoopi Cushion Farts reverse the mutations. To Zlatan's ponytail coming to life and being voiced by SpongeBob's Tom Kenny. Ponytail? That's my name, don't wear it out. Since when do you talk? Well, since that mutant slug bit me. He was supposed to latch onto your head, but he latched onto me. Despite the bizarreness of this movie though, it's actually pretty dang uninspired because it doesn't have a single original bone in its body, indiscreetly borrowing all of its ideas from Space Jam, Ghostbusters, Scooby-Doo, and John Carpenter's The Thing. It's a carbon copy Frankenstein of various superior pop media that lacks any unique identity of its own. The mutants themselves have pretty creepy looking designs for kids movie standards, but the constant goofy antics and slapstick stop them from being legitimately threatening villains. Hey, get your green glowy paws off my snickerdoodles! <laughs> kids might connect with the youthful heroes of the story, but I can't say that they're actually likeable or well-written characters. Most of them are pretty one note, and the only kid with any personality at all has an annoying running gag of asking for a selfie every 30 seconds. Can I get a selfie? Still not the time! These children are also pretty crappy at their jobs as creature catchers. I didn't see a group of precocious kids with special skills, because their clumsy mistakes and blunders outweigh their successes. No, I run! Get out of there! You what? and the high points only happen by accident. Hey! Whoa! <sighs> Kiss into Football might be severely disappointed by the movie as well. Like, none of the celebrity soccer stars can actually voice act, and they're lead characters in this film, not guest cameos. So we have to listen to their awkwardly wooden acting for the whole movie. Zlatan, we need you to juggle. I can't. My talent has been stolen. All I have now is my beauty. But what's worse for football fans is that there's barely any actual sports action. Yes, the soccer football movie has hardly any soccer football. We don't get to see any match until the last 10 minutes of the film. It's not even an exciting match, because the clunky and bland animation holds everything back. Plus, the game doesn't even last that long. These mutant slugs are on the move, much like Mannequin 2. Whoa! Zlatan! Limbo's in for a steal! Now, even though I've complained about this movie into the ground, there are reasons why I've not ranked it lower. Weird Al is far from a threatening villain, and the comedy material he's given will only make easily tickled little kids laugh. But he has this crazy Looney Tunes energy that's kind of sort of fun. I'd go as far as to say that he's the least awful part of this movie. Ponytail, prepare to meet my trusty giant shears! I also like that the film shows that girls are into sports just as much as boys. Despite our changing times, there's actually not that many female-led sports films for kids out there. So kudos to this crappy film for at least having that going for it. Night to the Museum, Common Ra rises again. When Larry the Night Guard decides to move to a job in Tokyo, he leaves his insecure teenage son, Nick, in charge of guarding the enchanted museum that comes to life at night. However, an old foe, Common Ra, has come back and wants to use a tablet to rule the world. This film does have a few sparks of creativity, from a scene where the tablet enchants an art museum, and the paintings become more fantastical. How do you like oil paintings? <laughs> to the running gag of Common Ra's disappointed father appearing for a variety of depictions. Why do you get to be in all the museums and not me? You really want to have this conversation now? There's also the sense of camaraderie between the museum's magic characters. They've spent every night together, so they have this family bond that unites them and motivates them to look out for each other. 
But at least I can say, I have friends like you. Aww. Aww. That's as much praise as I can muster up for this movie though, because everything else doesn't work or comes off as underwhelming. For example, the whole thing does not look like a feature film. I kept forgetting that this was supposed to be a 90 minute sequel to a Hollywood franchise. Because the animation is good for TV standards, but is in no way cinematic looking. There's nothing remarkable about this sequel too. It's your typical villain returns to get revenge on our heroes, and rehashes his same shtick all over again. Sure, he partners up with the God of Chaos, but all this guy does is shoot laser eyes, making him more predictable than chaotic. Shoot! The movie did sometimes get a snicker out of me, but much like the other Night of the Museum films, most of the comedy comes from characters bantering with each other for ages and ages and ages until maybe a joke lands. I've never been a fan of this kind of overwritten hit or miss humour. Silly night! That was a metaphor! The only metaphor I need is to literally vanquish you in battle! Ugh, metaphors are literally no. not literal! Fine, ah. how about after I slay you? Ah. I dance on your grave! No! There's no dancing! I was just trying to roast you! But what bothered me the most about this film was the charmless character of Nick, our lead hero. He spends the entire film complaining, whining, or self-deprecating. I'm not cut out for this. I'm only 18. I'm just a stupid kid who's in way over his head. I get that teenagers can be moody and super insecure, but Nick has no endearing qualities that make me want to cheer him on, or root for him to find his confidence. This was possibly the best straight-to-video Disney Plus sequel that we got this year, but that is far, far, far from a high ovation when the competition was so rubbish. Look, Orphan Sam Greenfield has just turned 18 and has to enter the adult world without a family. Unfortunately, she has a lot of bad luck as a person, so things never go right for her. One day, Sam generously gives part of her panini to a cat, and the cat leaves behind a lucky penny that gives Sam a new string of good luck. Then... She accidentally loses said penny and goes into panic mode because she wanted to give the lucky coin to her orphanage friend Hazel to help her get adopted. Hazel then bumps into the cat again, who reveals that he's a magic cat from the world of luck, called Bob. Sam follows Bob into his dimension, and she tries to find a new lucky penny, but she has no luck, and decides to shut down the bad luck machine for a day to help Hazel get adopted, which causes a huge malfunction that leads to bad luck taking over the whole universe. Meanwhile, the head of the company, a dragon called Babe, has a strong fear of bad luck and vows to get rid of it somehow. I was not looking forward to this movie, knowing that sex pest and abusive employer John Lasseter was attached to the project, a fact made worse by how John has reportedly not changed. Then I finally saw it and was not impressed in the slightest. It's like watching a mobile video game advert company trying to copy the Pixar formula and style. The world building in particular is just terrible. Every single scene introduces a brand new element of the world of luck which results in a dimension that's way too overdeveloped and busy. I felt like I was taking a dull factory tour rather than watching an entertaining story. Wait, they actually think up the good luck? Yeah, those two work in Happy Accidents, one of the many good luck departments like Lucky in Love, Front Row Park is about Ooh, right place, right time. The film tries to teach this inside out kind of lesson using bad luck, but it just doesn't work. Sam preaches that bad luck can lead to good luck and that the bad luck department working in this building are well-meaning people. But let's not act like bad luck doesn't cause any casualties or the bad luck always leads to good luck. There's a big difference between encouraging audiences to accept that bad luck is part of life and overselling bad luck as this inherently great thing. I blamed bad luck for everything that went wrong in my life. But coming here, I realized that it also made some things go very right. Without my bad luck, I wouldn't have met Hazel or Bob. The movie really leans into how selfless and generous Sam is despite her misfortunes, with characters always telling her how compassionate she is. But I have to argue otherwise. She's putting the fate of this universe's natural order in jeopardy just to help one little girl get adopted. Millions of little girls are in the same position as Hazel. Why does Sam's friend get special attention? Speaking of adoption though, I did quite like how the film shines a light on the struggles of older kids in foster homes. I think that's a very important cause to raise, because a lot of older kids aren't cute enough for some adopting parents. It's not fair and kind of shallow. I guess we weren't lucky enough to find you that forever family. Look is a boring, empty, and soulless movie that creatively fails on so many levels. Skydance are really going to have to raise their game with whatever they make next. Lightyear. A Star Command vessel, nicknamed the Turnip, has landed on Takani Prime. 
Space Rangers Buzz Lightyear and Alicia Hawthorne explore the planet to mine resources. If the planet is habitable, then Buzz can wake up the people sleeping in the turnip, but unfortunately, they're attacked by hostile life forms. The team try to escape, only for Buzz to crash the turnip. In order to leave the planet, Star Command needs a working hyperspace fuel crystal. Buzz volunteers to be the pilot for the crystal's test, but every time Buzz performs his mission, he ends up skipping many years. Sadly, this means that he has to watch Alicia start a family and grow old without him. Eventually, a new commander is put in charge and orders for Buzz's mission to be disbanded. Buzz is sad at first, but then he finds out that his personal robot cat, Socks, has found the perfect formula for a stable crystal. So Buzz sneaks into a ship with Socks, tests out the formula, and it proves completely effective. However, our hero has arrived at a time when Takani Prime has been taken over by robots led by the giant Zerg. Luckily for Buzz, a team of junior rangers made up of Izzy Hawthorne, granddaughter of Alicia, the dopey Mo, and an elderly convict called Darby, who were willing to help him save the day, but Lightyear insists that he has to work alone. We then later find out that Zerg is actually a Buzz Lightyear from a different timeline, who's been consumed with an obsession to fix everything. I was pretty hyped up for this Toy Story spin-off movie. Unfortunately, after finally watching it, I was pretty let down with what we were given. The movie wants to teach a lesson about how obsessing over success and not appreciating the now can lead you down the wrong path. The problem is that this is a near-perfect Buzz Lightyear, a noble, squeaky-clean scout boy. Sure, he could be insensitive or bad-tempered sometimes, but I really don't buy that he's on the dark way to becoming Emperor Zerg. It's a twist for the sake of a twist, like a lot of Disney villains lately. You and me, we're not the same. I'm sorry. No, Buzz. I'm sorry. The Junior Rangers are pretty likeable, plucky heroes in training who show potential. But I can't say that I ever became emotionally attached to any of these characters. I liked them, but I didn't love them. They're mainly here for comic relief fluff or to serve as props for Buzz's lesson on teamwork. Buzz, we need you. Wait, in there? But if it doesn't work, I won't be able to save you. You don't need to save us. You need to join us. Lightyear garnered a lot of attention for featuring a lesbian character in a Disney family film. But as someone by, I don't think that this is a good example of queer representation done right. Because Alicia follows the harmful bury your gaze trope, in which a queer character is killed off to inspire the straight lead hero. I also wasn't a fan of the movie's pacing. There's this constant, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, flow to the storytelling that rushes things along. It's one major reason why I struggle to get invested in anything in the movie. Heck, a lot of the film just feels like a feature-length chase scene. Remember from training, you don't pull the trigger, you squeeze the trigger. I know. Uh, 99% complete. Transfer to oscillating power. power. Done. The only aspect of this movie that I enjoyed was Socks the Cat. He's a cute robot emotional support character who can be adorably funny and helpful to the mission at hand. Although it is very obvious that he's only in the movie to sell toys for Disney. Hey, you're not authorized to be in this area. <laughs> For Pixar standards, this is a pretty average film. I've watched it twice, and I still feel lukewarm about the whole thing. It's such a meh disappointment. Feel free to check out my review of the film for a more in-depth opinion. Pause of Fury, The Legend of Hank. High-ranking official Ikuchu wants to expand his palace into the impoverished village of Kakamucho. When the Shogun learns that Kakamucho has no samurai to protect it, he commands Ikuchu to send someone. So Ikuchu picks a bumbling dog called Hank. At first, Kakamucho despises Hank for being a dog, and they won't give him a chance. Luckily, Hank meets a retired drunken samurai called Jimbo, who agrees to mentor him into a skilled warrior. After Hank defeats Ikachu's henchman Sumo, the dog becomes a celebrity, and the fame goes to his head. Originally titled Blazing Samurai, this film was stuck in production hell for quite a long time. Sadly, I have to say that nothing about this movie screams that it took years to put together, or that there was any dedication into improving what wasn't working. It looks like a straight-to-video movie, and there's already an abundance of cheap martial arts talking animal movies and bargain bins. It's just this vanilla hero's journey tale about being yourself, with a run-of-the-mill rags-to-riches downfall thrown in. The ninjas showed up again last night, and where were you? Having fun with your boss. What about you? I failed my oath for the last time. What's weird, though, is that this is supposed to be a loose remake of Mel Brooks's Blazing Saddles. No, I'm not trying to pull your leg or troll you. What we have here is a family-friendly version of a raunchy Western comedy, but I would not call Pause of Fury a good Mel Brooks tribute. Everything that makes a Mel Brooks comedy classic has been diluted for a younger audience, and the film has a hard time readjusting its humour. A few gags did get a laugh out of me, but in a film that rapifies joke after joke in the vein of Mel Brooks, 
it's not a good sign that I mainly heard tumbleweed. Sure, I did appreciate when a joke showed a surprising sense of wind, but that was a rare treat. For the most part, I just glazed over as I watched these characters I never cared about sluggishly following the story beats of a superior comedy film. It's quite a red flag when a movie makes me wish I was watching something else. I was also totally baffled by what the movie was even supposed to be going for. You can really tell that this film has been passed around a variety of people with different visions. Because I couldn't tell what direction it was taking, or the purpose it had in mind for doing a Kung Fu Panda spin on Blazing Saddles. What are you learning? I don't like sticks as much as I used to. What are you learning in here? The thing that marketing pushed the most about this film was its star-studded voice cast. Yeah, it's pretty impressive that a film this average and uninspired managed to get hold of so many A-list stars. But with the exception of Samuel L. Jackson as Jimbo... How about a little nip? A little cat nip? Um... I don't think I'm uh, More for me. Most of the cast doesn't really stand out. They're just there. And Ricky Gervais has been severely miscast as the campy villain. I didn't expect much of you, and you still disappointed me. Listen, the cats of Kakamucho are no closer to leaving than when we started. Bowser Fury is such a boring and forgettable waste of time that I actually found myself being more interested in learning about the movie's production history, which I'm sure is far more compelling than the finished product. Fireheart. It's the 1930s. George Nolan really wants to become a firefighter, just like her dad Sean, but that's not socially acceptable yet. Meanwhile, a smoky paranormal phenomenon is taking place in theatres and kidnapping firefighters to check it out. So, the mayor asks Sean to come out of retirement and put together a special investigative team. Georgia uses this case as an opportunity to disguise herself as a man called Joe so that she can join her dad's force. Fireheart does have a promising start as a movie, a defiant teenage girl having to pull off a disguise in the sexist 30s as she teams up with a band of talented misfits to take on a supernatural mystery. It's like Mulan meets Ghostbusters, which sounds really cool. However, the fun of this premise starts to show its crags once we dive into the actual mystery. The movie tries extremely hard to convince us that it's the mayor behind this crime, but he's so obviously a red herring. It's never ever the character that's the most fishy. Once the film introduced the character of Pauline, a nervous and shy struggling actress who is assisting a big star, I knew it was her right away. Not because the film left great clues that helped the audience play detective, but due to how this character trope has become the cliché for a twist villain. Oh, and what do you know, it was poorly all along with special effects. I was kind of hoping that this purple smoky villain really was something otherworldly. It would have made this a weirder and stranger firefighting film. While I was doing research on this movie, I actually came to learn that the real first ever female firefighter was a former slave called Molly Williams. Okay, so this film is taking historical liberties with Georgia. Many period animated films tend to do that. But... The movie also features an actual former slave character, and she's this unflattering caricature who becomes the punching bag for a lot of the film's slapstick. Then, in the film's end credits, there's a tribute to first women firefighters, and Molly is never mentioned. I'm sorry, but this is a really, really bad look on the movie that makes me question the filmmaker's intentions. Fireheart had the potential to be a really unique rescue service movie set in the 30s, but it just ends up devolving into being a product of so many things that are wrong with animated movies today. Bubble. In a dystopian bubble ridden Tokyo, various teenagers hold parkour tournaments to win supplies. 18-year-old Hibiki is exceptionally good at the sport, but struggles to connect to the others due to his hearing oversensitivity. One day, though, Hibiki meets a mysterious alien girl that he names Uta. She becomes intensely obsessed with him and joins his parkour team. I will say that this movie has dazzling and stunning animation. You will not hear me complain about the quality of the visuals. It's just everything else that falls flatter than a pancake. While it is cool to see an animated movie about parkour, a sport that lends itself to the dynamic fluidity of animation, I cannot say that I found myself actually engaged in these games. Yes, they're very stylishly animated, but there's just no tension or fun here because our two lead characters are insanely overskilled. How can I be on the edge of my seat when our heroes are pretty much almost unbeatable? The romance aspect didn't do anything for me either. I was already laughing at how Uda is the least subtle manic pixie dream girl I've ever seen. Then, the movie gives us two or three scenes of them hanging out together, setting up the beginning of their bond, but their relationship is put on pause after they find out that their friend has been kidnapped. Then Hibiki suddenly falls in love with Uta while they're on their serious rescue mission. 
only to skip straight to a big convention scene, which is dramatically interrupted by the movie's big spectacular finale that forces us to suddenly be emotionally invested in their fate as a couple. Bubble is very obviously an alien twist on The Little Mermaid story, but the film goes to extreme lengths to make audiences notice that. As if it's afraid that we won't connect the dots ourselves, it uses very heavy-handed narration to nudge audiences into seeing how Bubble is sharing events with the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. She fully understood her body was rapidly turning into sea foam. Fear was a complete stranger to her. When Uta is turning to foam, like in the story, I felt absolutely nothing. No tears, no pain, no sorrow. The movie rushed the chemistry between these two so fast that I couldn't develop any heartache for the darkest part of the Little Mermaid story. Uta! 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 This film also features neurodivergent characters. None of them are particularly offensive. Heck, most of them are quite accurate, and I say that as someone autistic myself. However, I wasn't comfortable with how Hibiki says that he finally feels that he can be himself after meeting a space alien. That is a little insulting to me. And the person that I thought I was before wasn't really me. After meeting you, I became myself. Bubble has a fascinating premise for an anime film, and I'll stand by how great the animation is, but the execution is so shallow. Strange World. In the land of Avalonia, Jaeger and his son Searcher are on a quest to save their world. Searcher discovers an energy plant called Pando that'll solve everything, but Jaeger insists on going on without everyone, and is annoyed that Searcher won't join him as an explorer. Years later, Searcher is now running a Pando farm, and insists that his son Ethan joins the trade. But Ethan would rather find his own thing. When Searcher learns that Pando is losing its power, he joins the crew on an adventure to a strange world to find the source of the problem, only to bump into his long-lost dad, leading to all three generations uniting. I've been a little nervous to talk about this one, not because I have a controversial opinion on it or anything. My problem is that I have barely any strong feelings on Strange World. I came out of the cinema mainly feeling lukewarm, and made the verdict that it's, well, adequate? I agree with the consensus that it's very tropey as if it's following a checklist for making a successful Disney film, and begrudgingly ticking off each cliché. I never felt like I was watching a brand new Disney experience, but rather, a fuzzy dream of House of Mouse movies I've seen before. Any time I found myself wanting to compliment something, I had to remind myself that other Disney films had done it before, and with more personality and imagination. It makes it really hard for me to come up with interesting criticism, or pin down what makes this film special, but at the same time, there's nothing here that's remarkably bad either. Everything is just done fine. It's all fine. I'm sure others have their own complaints, but I've got nothing. The only thing I can genuinely praise is the fact that it's the first Disney movie to star a lead gay character. And he's a great representation. The farmer. Uh. Here, I'll trade you. This one feels more Ethan to me. Being gay isn't his one defining character trait, he's his own unique person going through a coming of age journey, but it's his adventure that gives him the confidence to ask out his crush. Oh, and I like that when Ethan came out to his granddad, we didn't get the cliche gay panic scene, his granddad didn't make a big deal out of it, or reject his grandson, breaking the stereotype of older generations being inherently homophobic, and avoiding a queer trauma that we're tired of seeing in mainstream cinema. Who is it? Uh, it's no one. Uh, Diazzo. His name is Diazzo. Diazzo, huh? I really like him a lot. I just don't know how to tell him because I just get this. I always get so this. Hey, let your grandpa give you some solid advice. As mediocre as it is, I do hope that its recent success on Disney Plus motivates Disney to make more queer animated movies. Minions The Rise of Gru Set in the 70s, this despicable meme prequel is about Gru working with the Minions for the first time, as he tries to join the famous villain squad, the Vicious Six, after they've just kicked out their oldest member, Wild Knuckles. Unfortunately, the Vicious Six rejects Gru based on his size and age, so he tries to prove himself by stealing their precious Zodiac medallion. However, while trying to escape the Vicious Six, one Minion, Otto, trades the medallion for a pet rock. Suddenly, Knuckles kidnaps Gru, demanding for the medallion that Gru lost. So the minions go on an adventure to rescue their mini-boss. 
taking up martial arts lessons to have a fighting chance. The Rise of Gru was better than I expected it to be. Is it a new classic that'll change public opinion on Illumination? Oh hell no. But it's at least watchable compared to the lower films on my list. Firstly, I did enjoy the 70s grindhouse style that the movie went with. I liked the warm oranges and yellows of this period, and you do kind of feel like you've been transported to the 70s era. Where's Gru? Ah, how should I know? What's with the costumes? Halloween was four months ago, you look stupid! While the villains don't really get much interesting development, I thought that the Vicious Six had fun gimmicks that made me chuckle. Say what you will about this franchise, but these films always give us entertainingly weird baddies. Guess who stole the mask? <laughs> And when the Vicious Six finally get back their medallion, they have some awesome Zodiac animal transformations that make them legitimately intimidating to our heroes. <laughs> As a prequel, it's a decent effort. It doesn't have any surprising revelations or neat twists, but the backstories for characters or inventions make sense and manage to play into the story without being distracting, though I would have appreciated a little more insight into Gru's childhood. Despite being called The Rise of Gru, the film is a little more invested in the kung fu shenanigans of the minions than the movie's actual stronger plot, that being the bond between Gru and Knuckles. They develop this somewhat compelling grandfather and granddad relationship, which is moving when you remember that Gru has a terrible family. Look what I got! Hey, not bad! Not bad at all! We make a good team! We do? Oh yeah! Hey, we gotta keep at it! Wait till you see what I'm gonna teach you next! Minions The Rise of Gru is okay at best. Nothing terrible, but also nothing worth rushing to see. Drifting home. Kosuke and Natsume are childhood friends who grew up like siblings. One summer day, Kosuke, Natsume, and their school friends end up in a fight on the rooftop of their childhood apartment. It then suddenly rains, only for said rain to leave behind an entire ocean, trapping the kids in the building, where they try to survive together and work out what's happening. To add to the mystery, a strange boy called Nobo has randomly appeared. I really liked how dreamlike this movie is. I have a lot of dreams that resemble the atmosphere of this film, and it was fun seeing my subconscious imagination in some kind of anime form. I'm sure that many of us will feel the same while watching Drifting Home. But the thing that drew me into the film the most was the survival aspect. I'm a big fan of stories about characters adapting to living somewhere weird. I got really into watching how these kids tried to keep themselves entertained and what methods they used to get food. I was especially engaged whenever a character hopped onto a floating building to find groceries. Any food over there? No, nothing. Some emergency rations or... I don't even get how this is possible. This building was torn down when I was in the third grade. We do also eventually learn that Nopo is actually a spirit that watched over the siblings as younger kids, revealing that this is a world where supernatural guardians look over nostalgic locations that meant a lot to kids, a sentiment that kind of touched me. I remember you. You used to come here with your father, right? Saying all this though, I like this movie, but I don't love it. There are a lot of ideas and concepts here that I usually tend to gravitate towards. It's just that a lot of things prevent the film from hitting that sweet spot of becoming an anime classic. Like, I found the kids' frequent bickering and fighting to be very grating, especially when they commonly argue about the same topics again and again and again. Look, I get that these are scared little kids, and they must be very stressed, but it doesn't exactly make for gripping drama. Just because something's realistic doesn't make it interesting to watch. That thing isn't human. It's a monster. Don't talk like that, Reyna. Yeah, we're all one big happy family. Do you think we're playing house here? Maybe you're forgetting that you're the reason we're here in the first place. However, the biggest problem is that it's way, 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 way too long. Just when you think it's reached a fitting climax and the kids are almost home, the movie drags things on with an out of nowhere over the top disaster film finale. Look, it's okay to end a film without some bombastic climax. These characters have grown closer and found confidence in themselves while stuck at sea. That's enough of a reason to wrap things up. I really wanted to love Drifting Home. It has all the hallmarks and ingredients of a film that I should adore, but it really needed some cutting, tweaking, and polishing to have a fighting chance to be higher on my list. DC League of Super Pets. Superman and Crypto are the best of friends and love fighting crime together as partners. However, Crypto becomes super jealous of Clark's girlfriend Lois Lane, which causes a rift between Clark and his dog. Meanwhile, 
At an animal shelter, a group of animals yearn to escape to a better home, but one animal, Lulu the guinea pig, who used to be Lex Luthor's test subject, dreams of world domination. One night, Lulu gets her hands on a powerful orange kryptonite, which gives herself and the shelter animals superpowers. Lulu then takes away Crypto's powers, kidnaps the whole Justice League, and creates a team of superpowered guinea pigs for minions. Crypto must partner up with the newly gifted shelter animals to stop Lulu and save the Justice League. I don't think that this film is anything groundbreaking. It's a typical superhero blockbuster with all the tropes you would expect. The only twist is that our heroes are animals this time. It's just a decently made summer action movie for the whole family, which is fine. The teamwork aspect is a bit by the numbers and just kind of happens. Crypto is quick to team up with the shelter animals out of desperation. He gets a character profile for every pet from their leader Ace. And it just takes a fast little monologue from Crypto to motivate each super pet. Chip, we all go to dark places. I thought about throwing Lois Lane in the ocean. But you can't spend the rest of your life stuck in your own head. You're right. But there is something moving about how these shelter animals are abandoned or neglected pets. Their confidence has been knocked by how humans have treated them, and it's their new roles as superheroes that elevates their self-assurance. None of them let their powers go to their heads. They're just cute, homeless animals who genuinely appreciate their look. Oh my gosh, Wonder Woman hits that like right where I'm sitting. Actually, I feel like I am her because I'm just like in her stance, I'm in her seat, and there's a peanut wedge in the crack of the seat, and now I'm eating her peanut. I actually liked how little melodrama there even was in this movie. Sure, Ace and Crypto have their disagreements, but they end up learning from each other. It's refreshing to see a superhero team just being a superhero team. I also loved how Crypto's insecurity over Lois joining the family can be very relatable to kids. Many children deal with the confusing feelings of getting a new step-parent, and kids will resonate with Crypto learning to accept domestic changes. I'm happy for you, buddy. The movie was a lot funnier than I expected it to be, too. I thought it was just going to be a series of lowbrow jokes that pandered to kids. But I actually found myself laughing quite a lot. Yeah, there were big gaps between each time I laughed, but I'd say that this is a good comedy. Turtle, use your speed and get the. Ah. Where the f am I? What entertained me the most, though, was our diva villain Lulu. This campy guinea pig with a human complex has a disturbing adoration for a laboratory abuser, which backfires on her once betrayed. Lex. Lex, what are you doing? We're a team. Like we were scientists together. No, Lex, what are you doing? I mean, come on. You didn't expect me to share credit with a rodent, did you? But even without Lex, she's still a force to be reckoned with, thanks to the chaotic nature of her minions and her clever two steps ahead villain scheming. What are you talking about? Oh, did I forget to mention my evil plans grand finale? In 28 minutes, the entire Justice League is gonna go kaboom. If I can't have my guy, then you can't have yours. It's also kind of hilarious how this tiny little rodent has managed to screw over humanity and do everything that Lex Luthor failed. DC League of Super Pets was a delightful surprise to me that surpassed all my expectations, sometimes pulled on my emotions with its cuteness, and kept me invested from beginning to end. It's not any kind of cinematic game changer, but I wouldn't mind going back to watch it again. So, we're halfway through the video. I'd just like to remind folks to consider subscribing to my channel for more animation-related content. Thank you. The Amazing Maurice. Based on a book by Terry Pratchett, this film is about an egocentric cat called Maurice, who's partnered up with a community of super-intelligent rats and a piper called Keith to run a money-making scam. When our heroes arrive in a new town, though, they realise that something strange is happening. With help from the book-obsessed militia, Maurice and his friends must uncover the mystery of what's going on. Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels were a huge part of my childhood. I loved borrowing them all from the library to read at bedtime, and it was a family tradition to listen to Pratchett audiobooks on car trips. I've not read Pratchett its work in a long time, but I still have an affectionate nostalgia for them. I can't say how faithful this movie is to its book, because I don't remember reading this one, but Terry Pratchett's sense of humour comes through fine, which is quite an achievement when the script was penned by an American. I was very into the world building for these rats too. You can tell that they're a tightly knit group, and you get a very vivid idea of their culture, philosophies, and customs. I could actually watch a whole movie of these hyper-intelligent rodents just living their lives. I'm also a sucker for arrogant and pompous characters who let their vulnerability slip, which is pretty much what Maurice is. There's this elegance and charisma to his stuck-up snobbiness that kept me entertained, and I love how he has to resort to being just an ordinary and regular cat to save the day. To be honest, it was the villain that I loved the most. Based on a real scientific phenomenon called Rat King, 
Our baddie is basically a bunch of rats tied together to create an uncanny and creepy untangled monster. He's one of the most disturbing kids movie villains I've ever seen. There was only one thing that I didn't like about this movie, and that was Malicia. While it's awesome to see a character being this passionate for books, I found her constant meta-references to be more annoying than charming. Her main character trait is just to analyse every single thing around her. It's like an English teacher keeps interrupting my movie. The Amazing Maurice is a delightful tribute to Pratchett that's full of his usual British quirks, but its clunky attempt at meta-commentary kind of lets it down a bit. Scrooge A Christmas Carol This is an animated remake of the classic 70s Christmas Carol musical, which tells the traditional Charles Dickens story of Ebenezer Scrooge, a cruel, rich old man who mistreats his employees and looks down on the poor, only for free ghosts of Christmas to visit him to teach a lesson. The main draw of this movie has to be its beautiful and creative art style. The talented artist's character designs and visual effects team's imagination take the forefront of this movie. There's been loads of attention given to the remarkably handsome design of Scrooge himself, too. Some have criticised the film for making this Ebenezer dashing instead of crookedly ugly, while others have been thirsting after the Silver Fox. Personally, I see it as a healthy reminder that no matter how attractive someone gets as they mature, they can still be terrible people with a history of misdeeds. So you better pack up your trumpets before I call the police. To throw you all in prison, leaving me in peace. I wouldn't say that the film is style over substance, because there's certainly a lot of sincere emotion behind Scrooge's animation, and the film handles the more sensitive scenes with earnesty. When you met home, you were set free. A love for you was plain. But I will say that the movie puts a lot of emphasis on theatrical spectacle. This direction can be hit or miss sometimes. Said spectacle can really gravitate the emotions and drama of some scenes. Plus the consistent imagery of time helps to give the movie a visual motif that I've never seen before for this story. But the grandiose artistic labour of the movie does end up sacrificing the tale's renowned atmosphere and pace. Because the movie is always hopping from one ghost to the next, and we don't really get much time to soak in the hauntings of Scrooge's home. I also didn't like how this remake shoehorns in some pointless pixies who just end up being irritating distractions. Instead, let us celebrate those who are here. Hear, hear. Speaking of additions and alterations, I did quite like a few fresh new ideas that the film went with like how the ghost of Christmas present physically transforms into the future, as if we're watching the darkness consume the light. Are you still in there, giant? The fellow in the green robes? Like life and so forth? No. You are something else entirely. Or how the film doesn't end with Scrooge visiting folks on Christmas Day, like we've come to expect, but instead, invites everyone into his festively redecorated home, which can be seen as a gesture of welcoming those he pushed out back into his redeemed life. It's the doll from my mother's picture. Uncle, I can't accept this. You must. It's a gift from an old fool who regrets all the Christmases we never shared. Oh, Uncle! <laughs> Thank you! Scrooge A Christmas Carol has its rough edges and does get a little carried away with its visuals and noises at points. Plus, I do think that the original 70s movie is the better film. But I wouldn't call it a bad adaptation, because you can tell that it's been made with love, and it gives a lot of very talented artists the centre stage. The Bob's Burgers movie. The Belchers are in a lot of trouble. Not only do they owe the bank money, but a pothole accident outside their restaurant has ruined their revenue. Things get worse when Louise finds a skeleton inside the hole, which is linked to a Wonder Wolf murder of a carny. And the Belcher's wealthy landlord, who could actually save the family financially, Mr. Fishoda, is the number one suspect. The Belcher kids decide to go on a quest to find the real killer so that they can free Mr. Fishoda and save their restaurant from closing. Meanwhile, Bob, Linda, and Teddy try to keep up business by illegally selling burgers on the Wonder Wharf. This is pretty much a very long episode of the Bob's Burgers TV show, more than an actual movie. Is that a bad thing? Well, I guess it depends on how you look at it. On the one hand, this means that we get a 90-minute episode of one of the best Fox cartoons, with everything we already love about the show packaged in. On the other hand, I can't really say that it earns its theatrical release, or even the movie part of its title. Sure, on a visual level, the Bob's Burgers movie is a huge step up, because the animation has been given a bouncier and livelier touch, but narratively, it's on the same scale as a two-part story like The Bleakening. 
That being said, the content we are given is still pretty dang entertaining. Like there's a huge abundance of jokes that make me laugh on every viewing. If you enjoy this show's trademark sense of humour, then you'll be very satisfied by the movie Silly Comedy. Sergeant Bosco, you know you left the light on the top of your car. Huh? What? Oh, damn it! Son of a... Ugh. Okay, at least no one saw. They don't know I'm here. Get away! Get away! Shoo! Shoo! Hey, kids! Hey, Louise! Hey, Critter! You bothering that nice policeman? No. I'm not a policeman. What are you... Son of a dick! There's also this running theme of togetherness that gives the film its heart. The Belchers share this mutual passion for saving the restaurant, keeping Bob's dream alive, and sheltering the family. No matter how wacky things get, it's a movie about family through and through. Oh, Bobby, kids, I want you all to know how much I love you. I love you too, Mom. I love all you mamma jammas. I love all of you too. We don't have to, like, do any kind of order. Why did we bring that up? Okay, I'm hardly I love you, so the kind of thing you say when we're gonna die, and we are not gonna die. The film is also one of the far less alienating TV-to-feature film adaptations. Regular audiences will totally understand and follow along fine, maybe even becoming charmed by the Belgians by the end, but long-time fans will be given a little extra bacon on their cheeseburger. The movie isn't without its flaws, though. For example, it tries to squash in a character arc for all three Belcher kids, but has a hard time tying these plots into the main story, with only Louise's arc of bravery being neatly wrapped into the Goonies-esque adventure that the kids take. I was too scared to go in the hole. I was too scared to open the secret nipple door. Tina had to do it for me, and I wear these freaking ears. I mean, if you're brave, you don't have to prove you're brave, you just are brave. I also only remember one song in the whole film, Sunny Side Up, a super cheery and catchy number that fits into the movie's motif of staying optimistic in hard times. When you have that just unstopped optimistic spirit, it's, it's gonna, gonna be, be the sunny side of summer of our lives. Ooh. Every other song though, well, I've watched this film twice now and I honestly can't remember how any of them go. They're not bad, they just didn't stick with me. Something I noticed on my second viewing too is how weak the mystery is in hindsight. You either guess that Grover Fish Odor is the killer right away, because of the dedicated screen time he gets despite not being that involved, or you end up being annoyed that the film focused way more on making Felix the Red Herring than giving the audience any clues to work with before the big reveal. I also wasn't fond of how Grover's villain motivation and backstory was exposition dumped into the film's longest musical number, a song that really took me out of the film because it kept going and going and going. However, I was pleasantly surprised by how the movie managed to make a dork in a pink tracksuit come off as threatening. That must have been quite the task. Alright, I'm hoping one of these is reverse. It'll be the one that makes us go backwards. Thanks. <laughs> oh, God. Ah, it's him! The brakes, Bob! The brakes! I'm stepping on the brakes! He's gonna push us into the hole! Despite his imperfections, I admire that the Bob's Burgers movie is a cinema release 2D hand drawn animated film that dared to compete against big CGI blockbusters while telling a story about a struggling working class family saving their livelihoods. That's what makes it the underdog of the year, and I can't help but cheer it on for that. Rise of the Team NT, the movie. In the distant future, Krang has taken over the world, and the Turtles are struggling to save Earth. So they send their disciple Casey Jones back in time to warn the younger Turtles of Krang's upcoming invasion. When Krang does crash onto Earth, though, he ends up possessing Raphael with alien flesh, and the poor guy becomes a mindless slave to Krang's regime. The Turtles, Splinter, April and Casey must alter the future by stopping Krang early and rescuing Raph from his possession. I've seen a lot of division over the rise of the TMNT cartoon series. This movie was actually my first introduction to the show. And you know what? I really don't get the hate. Yeah, it's a pretty goofy, silly and zany take on the Turtles, but let's not act like a Turtles cartoon has to be serious in order to be good. Plus, don't forget that the original comic was supposed to be a fun joke on superheroes. Heck, it's not like this film is devoid of any edge. It's a pretty grimy and nightmare fueled movie, especially for a Nickelodeon product. Like, I was pretty shocked by the lengths that the alien horror goes. Speaking of the space monsters, I found Krang's dark motive of quote-unquote improving Earth by fashioning it how he wants to be a very sinister intent for a Nicktoons villain. A glorious crusade continues to restore the natural order of things. The strong will devour the weak. Krang's whole Earth takeover also inspires this grand-scale Lovecraftian setting, with the stakes raised extremely high thanks to this sense of impending doom. What do we do now? I fear we are lost. The Krang are too powerful. 
I was also very engaged in the movie's exploration of time itself. Even though Casey has all the answers for the future, this information isn't set in stone. Our heroes come to learn that time can be changed, altered, and warped. You can't put 100% faith into the future, but you can create hope for it. Look, I'm done thinking I have all the answers. I don't know how to beat the Krang, but I do know our future isn't written until we write it. This ties really well into Leo's arc of self-realization. You see, he's going through a phase of arrogant refusal to work with others or follow orders. Casey revealing a positive future for him just makes him even more pompous. And Leo is hit with the hard truth that this future won't even happen if he continues his smug ways. You don't have all the answers all the time! But I'm the greatest ninja the world's ever seen, you said that! <sighs> I was wrong. What? You're impulsive, you're arrogant, and you don't see that every decision you make could cost someone their life. The animation for this movie also consistently blew me away. The movie mainly kept my attention through its splendidly fantastic animation. From the charismatically funny character animation from the cartoony turtles. This is it, Donnie. We're gonna get crushed! To the detailed, dynamic, fiery energy of the martial arts fights. I will admit that the film leans more towards pleasing fans of the TV show, more than entertaining the general public. I felt like I'd missed a few episodes that could have explained things like why the turtles have mystical powers, and stuff like that, but I still follow things along okay. The Rise of the Team NT movie was a lot of fun to me, and it has piqued my interest in checking out the original cartoon that inspired it. We're not like everyone else on this planet. We are... Beavis and Butthead do the universe. After Beavis and Butthead burn down a school science fair, a judge decides to send them to space camp, where they become sexually obsessed with a ship docking simulator. NASA astronaut Captain Serena Ryan is impressed by the boy's skills, and asks the two to join a real space journey, but Beavis and Butthead mistake this invite for an offer of sex. Once in space, Beavis and Butthead completely mess up the docking, which causes the astronauts to be stranded in the cosmos. So Serena kicks the boys out into space, only for the two idiots to fall into a black hole that transports them both to the year 2022. Serena, who is now governor of Texas, finds out that Beavis and Butthead are still alive, and vows to take them both down. At the same time, government officials have mistaken Beavis and Butthead for invading space aliens. With help from their far more intelligent multiverse counterparts, Smart Beavis and Smart Butthead, Beavis and Butthead must escape 2022 through a portal, but the boys are constantly distracted by the novelties of the year, or their quest for sex with Serena. Beavis and Butthead do the universe is the perfect companion piece to do America, because it follows the same formula, that being Beavis and Butthead interrupting a far more serious Hollywood style movie, except this time we get a more sci-fi spin on things. The best appeal of this movie is how freaking hilarious it is. I don't think an animated movie has made me laugh this much in ages. It helps that I'm a big Beavis and Butthead fan already, and find a lot of humour to these pubescent morons just being their usual chaotic selves, while they piss off their more mature peers. So you can ruin me and have me replaced as governor with one of your deep state assets? She said eight ass. Whoa! Eight ass! She said eight ass! Jesus, what is wrong with you? I did not say eight ass! She said it again! A major highlight has to be when Beavis turns into Cornholio in a prison of all places, which incites a prison riot for toilet paper rights. I am Cornholio! Like Mike Judge's other work, it's a flavour of comedy that could be best described as sophisticated lowbrow, clever satire that uses his character's antics to make a point about society. The portal is now over there, behind the classics building. It is well hidden there because no one cares about the humanities anymore. They want jobs that will allow them to pay off their student debt. Amusing, yes. Yes, humorous, yes. Satirical comment on the time. Yes, yes. amusing. I was also very surprised by how wholesome this movie was for a Beavis and Butthead cartoon. Not only does Beavis end up falling helplessly in love after mistaking a Syriab for the real Serena. We were eating some nachos, you know, and I love nachos, you know, and then um, and then I was thinking about you and me, and I just want to say um, that I also love um, <laughs> I, I um. <laughs> but Beavis and Butthead also face a fallout only to end up missing each other, and later coming to the epiphany that their kindred immaturity makes them the perfect best friends. Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe is such a funny and entertaining movie that I'd actually say that it's worth getting Paramount Plus just to watch it. Beavis, from now on, it's just gonna be you and me. 
and butthead. <laughs> I'm a dear. Wendell and Wilde. On a dark evening, Cat and her family are heading home from a fair. Suddenly, Cat finds a two-headed worm in a caramel apple, a scream distracts her dad from the road, and the family fall into the river. Cat's mom encourages her to escape, but her parents don't make it. Riddled with guilt and loneliness, Cat becomes a juvenile delinquent. Then, she's given a new chance with the Break the Cycle program, in which Cat is sent to a Catholic boarding school to be rehabilitated. The school is falling apart, though, and the headmaster, Principal Best, is actually working with the prison corporation Clax Corp. However, the Claxons decide to cut ties with Best, but Best also knows that they committed an arson homicide many years ago. So the rich couple murder the principal to avoid being exposed. Meanwhile, down in the underworld carnival known as the Scream Fair, run by Buffalo Belzer, are two demons called Wendell and Wild, who slave away applying hair cream to their dad's bald head, and both wish that they could build their own dream fair. Luckily for them though, they realize that the hair cream has the power to resurrect the dead. These demons also learn that Cat is their Hell Maiden, so they enter Cat's nightmares to trick her into summoning them into the land of the living, in return for bringing her parents back to life. Once Wendell and Wilde come to Earth, they test the cream out on Principal Best. Best then convinces Wendell and Wilde to make a deal with the Claxons. If the demons agree to resurrect the old guard to pass a vote for the Claxons' proposal to build a mega prison, then the wealthy couple will shower Best, Wendell and Wilde with riches for their funding. Cat, with help from her fellow Hell Maiden, Sister Helly, and her best friend Raoul, must stop Wendell and Wilde's hair cream chaos and prevent Clax Corp from pulling off their mega prison scam. This movie is a creative collaboration between stop motion master Henry Selick and horror filmmaker Jordan Peele, which I think is a match made in heaven. The most charming aspect has to be Wendell and Wilde themselves. They might be the antagonists of the story, but there's something endearing about a pair of bumbling demons who feel mistreated by their oppressive dad and just want to create an afterlife of joy and happiness. It's the hair cream's power that distracts them from remembering the heart of their mission. The fact that iconic comedy duo Key and Peele voice them both gives their brotherly bond so much chemistry and comedic appeal. We can't raise the dead? Well, we do know how to lie. <gasps> I like that plan. No problemo. That's right, you do your bit and we'll bring them back alive. That's ridiculous. The movie also tackles grief with a deep purpose. Cat isn't just suffering from the loss of her parents, she's also beating herself up for their death. The poor girl has turned to cutting the world off from her to survive. Yes, yeah, she does eventually get her parents back, but she's hit with the harsh reality that her mom and dad are now fragile corpses, and having zombie parents isn't the same as having living parents. At the end of the day, what Cat really needs to do instead of playing God is therapeutically face her traumatic memories head on. <laughs> You've tortured me for years. But you made me a survivor. And crazy powerful. The movie also satirizes the corruption of modern exploitative prison systems. You see, the Claxon's prison scheme relies on the couple saving their budget for themselves, leaving prisoners to rot away in horrible conditions, and never being given a chance for a redemption. I was actually taken back with shock that this movie for kids went out of its way to bravely and brutally dismantle the dark side of poorly run American prisons, teaching kids that even those who run prisons can be corrupt, and that prisons can often benefit their owners more than their prisoners. Well. You make a pile of money for every prisoner you take. So you pack them in like sardines, provide crap food, crap medical, dangerous conditions, and zero rehabilitation. <laughs> I am proud of you, dear. That's a business model, exactly. I want to have to praise this film for giving us one of the best representations for trans people in animation to date, Raoul. A trans teenage boy who isn't just a loyal and dedicated friend to Cat, but also an amazingly talented artist. I also loved how the film made characters correct any dead naming. It's none of your business, Ramona. I'm sorry, Raoul. I keep forgetting. And gave him a loving, accepting mother. What am I supposed to do now? I have a son to feed. No, a son, remember? You might be wondering why I'm not ranking this film higher. And well, if I'm honest, despite all the wonderful ideas it has, the execution is quite flawed. There's a bit too many plots being juggled, and we end up with some very messy storytelling. While Selick and Peel are a great partnership on paper, I can tell that they both had separate visions and interests, so the film can be quite erratic when it comes to deciding what to focus on. In spite of all this, I still loved Wendell and Wilde. I can easily look past its imperfections to appreciate its powerful themes, lovable characters, punk aesthetic, and fun black comedy. Yeah, it's a scuffed film, but if you dig under its muddy grave, you'll find magic. 
Apollo 10 and a half is space age childhood. Set during the 60s in Houston, Texas, this rotoscoped movie centers on a boy called Stanley, who ends up being chosen by NASA for a secret Apollo mission. While his loved ones think that he's off to summer camp, Stan is actually training to be a child astronaut and becoming the undocumented first person on the moon. What I love about this film is how it intricately develops Stanley's home life and environment. The movie goes into immense detail about every aspect of Houston in the 60s, as well as all the members of his family. It's so immersive that you end up feeling like you're really part of Stan's existence. At night, the games moved indoors, or on the back porch. So many classic board games. The film combines a slice-of-life atmosphere with history documentary graphics to really draw us into this world. I found myself fully captivated by the daily lives of this average Texan family, including their television habits, music tastes, and relationships with each other. Even though I never grew up in the 60s, this movie somehow feels incredibly nostalgic to me. I think it's mainly because the film helps us to relate to Stanley's childhood memories. My coming of age years were dramatically different to his, but I totally resonated with those little things that can stick with us as kids. But the highlight was probably getting to have a Frito pie for lunch, which was really just a bag of Fritos with the sides split open and a bunch of chili mixed in. When we finally see Stanley's space journey, it means so much to us as an audience, because the movie has vividly explored the cultural importance, social climate, and dramatic weight of the moon's landing. The whole thing ends up feeling like a fever dream, with the uncanny rotoscope adding to our strange travel back in time, and witnessing of an undercover experiment to send a kid into space. Big crater, very rocky. Well, it looks like you're gonna have to take over the controls and lander yourself. As someone who has a love for the slice of life genre, biographical storytelling, and the scary yet inspiring excitement of space travel, I was utterly mesmerized by this movie. So much so that I have a strong feeling that it's going to become one of my new comfort films. The House. This is a British stop motion animation anthology made up of three stories. Story one is about a working class family giving up their home to live in a luxury mansion, only for the parents to become the furniture. Story two centers on a scatterbrained house developer trying to sell a house he built to pay back his bills, but a family of vermin end up moving in for free. Lastly, Story 3 is about a landlady trying desperately hard to get money from her tenants in a house situated in a flooding world. However, a spiritual guru comes into her life and builds everyone a boat to escape. This is a very surreal collection of shorts that's often bewildering to follow, and might nauseate you with its weirdness. However, I found a charm to it and respected it for taking a chance with its unusual storytelling. It explores the very nature of a house, what a house means to a person, the way a house reflects its owner, and how a house can consume a person's life. There are running themes of materialism, luxury, and self-presentation throughout that tie every story together into a catalogue of weird adult fables. While the film isn't a horror movie in the traditional sense, there's quite a few moments that are bound to make you feel uncomfortable or disturbed, like nightmare fuel images that will stick with you, and how each house has this uneasy atmosphere. Every story is tied together with this profound meditation on humanity's attachment to houses, and the unhealthy obsession we can have with their appearance or legacy. While most of the tales can be pretty creepy, the last story bookends the trilogy with a message of optimism, and the value of leaving your home to find greater experiences. The house is hard to promote to others because it's so out there, but I think there's an appeal to its quirky personality and lessons on life. My Father's Dragon, an unseen woman tells the story of her dad, Elmer, who used to work in a fun countryside shop with his mom, Della, but their business eventually failed, and they had to move to the city. Della promised Elmer that they would raise funds for a new shop, but she ended up spending all the savings on calls for job interviews, which made Elmer feel betrayed. One day, Elmer fed and sheltered a homeless cat, but Della refused to let him keep it as a pet. Elmer ran away from home, and the cat revealed that she can help the boy find a mythical dragon, which he could use to make money to buy a new shop. The dragon, Boris, lived on a mysterious island where he held the whole land up. Elmer freed Boris, but Boris ended up wounding his wing, so Elmer and Boris went on an adventure to find a turtle who could help them. This is the most child-targeted animated movie from Irish Studio Cartoon Saloon, yet it manages to be just as challenging and mature as any of their darker or more serious films. I mean, it's very morally complex, because it addresses how both sides are as bad as each other for wanting to exploit Boris. He pulled the island up for you, over and over. I used him, yes, to keep us safe. <laughs> what did you use him for? I, I, I didn't. I, I'm his friend. 
He thought you were his friend. And how these island animals aren't evil. They're just scared of losing their home. And Elmo freeing Boris is actually putting them all in danger. I, I'm sorry. Why did you do it? Why did you take the dragon? He needed to be rescued. But who's gonna rescue us? The movie also goes out of its way to teach kids how human their parents are, and the immense responsibility that the parent holds, by using the fairy tale aspect as a parallel to the mother and son plotline. All through the poignant relationship between Boris and Elmer, as Elmer comes to sympathize with his mum's hardships. I have to do it on my own! No! You know what will happen to stop! I can't stop! You will burn up in there! You're wrong! Listen, I can help! Just, just let me help! Just stop! No, I stop. gotta go! Just let me go! At the same time though, Della faces the consequences of giving false hope to her child, because the disappointment just creates distrust and pushes him away. Scared. I got scared too. Boris also totally endeared me as a comic relief dragon. It's really tricky to write a comedic goofball who is annoying and funny at the same time, but Boris is a prime example of it done right because the writers find an appeal to his childlike curiosity and innocence. Is Never Blue your home? Never Green. It's called Never Green. It's, it's just a place where I live, but it's not my home. See, I, I used to have a store with my mom. So that's your home then? Uh, no, not anymore. Then where's your home? I, I don't have one right now. All in all, my father's dragon taps into a child's imagination, while also trusting that kids can understand that morality isn't always a simple good versus evil tale. It proves that children's movies can be smart and whimsical without ever sacrificing anything in the long run. The bad guys. Wolf, shark, tarantula, piranha, and snake are a team of criminals who keep getting away with their crimes. However, during a big heist, they end up being caught. While they're escorted to jail though, Wolf proposes to Governor Diane Foxington, the renowned good guy philanthropist Professor Rupert, should try experimenting with changing them into good guys. Wolf insists to his friends that this is all just a ruse, but secretly, he's actually been getting a taste for living the hero life lately, which makes Snake very suspicious. After the bad guys change the public's perception of them, they get to celebrate their newfound fame. But then they're suddenly framed for a crime, and it's revealed that they've been pawned in a scheme run by the Professor. Diane, who reveals herself to be the former criminal the Crimson Poor, agrees to help the bad guys clear their names and stop the Professor from pulling off his evil plan. This was one of the films that I was most hyped for in 2022, and dang did it deliver with flying colours. I love the chemistry between every single character, the unorthodox friendship of the bad guys as a team, the conflicting paths of Snake and Wolf, the sizzling romance of Wolf and Diane, and the aggressive rivalry of the bad guys versus the cop obsessed with them. Every scene is made super entertaining, all thanks to the strong relationship development on all ends. Today's his birthday! Not relevant! He's a sweetheart, you're a sweetheart. Well, look who's here. Took him long enough. You can easily forgive a lot of the things that don't make sense when the film is clearly not taking itself that seriously. Its tongue is firmly in its cheek as characters get away with stupid things thanks to the self-aware goofiness of everything. I want you to... Smack it! Skin it! Stab it! Sauté! Sing to it! Save it! I want you to set this up so obvious. I want you to save it! Oh, right! Right! <laughs> the animation steals the show too. It takes the illustrations of the original books and turns them into this stylistic and vibrant visual showcase that shakes up what we've come to expect from DreamWorks. Now, yes, we do get a twist villain, and if DreamWorks were trying to trick us, then I'd feel a little insulted because it was obvious the moment we met him. I'll also admit that his whole evil scheme is kind of convoluted because it relies heavily on very specific things happening in order for everything to work, but at least it's a big reveal that makes sense in hindsight. Plus, this particular twist villain does fit into a movie about not judging others by how they look. Looks like, yet again, the big bad wolf got outsmarted by a little piggy. You little pouchy cheeks! I'll kill you! Get him out! Get help! Get the big bad wolf is attacking me! The bad guys managed to peak to my top 10, all thanks to its fabulous design work, charming anti heroes, and brilliant sense of humor. Mad God. This stop-motion horror movie was a 30-year passion project for animation and visual effects wizard Phil Tippett. It centers on a mass character called the Assassin, who was sent down to the bowels of a hellish world to destroy it. 
I was on the fence about including this film, because some characters are played by live action actors. But you know what, I can tell that the animation is still the forefront, so I'm going to count it. Mad God is an unforgiving and relentless trip into the warped mind of Phil Tippett. It's a master artist magnum opus, and the passionate labour of love comes through in the intricate world building and inventive animation. The movie isn't your traditional, coherently structured film. It doesn't hold your hand with pretentious narration or pander to you with constant exposition dumping. It's down to the audience to interpret what's going on and speculate the themes it's possibly going for. Mad God isn't for the faint-hearted or easily sensitive. It explores the worst of humanity and the darkest fears that we universally feel. I actually found it eerily similar to nightmares I've had. I'd go as far as to say that this film is the closest any movie has gotten to capturing the horrors of my worst dreams. I think what stands out the most about it, though, is that you can really see the hard work that's been put into it. I buy the Phil Tipper put many, many, many years of his life into painstakingly bringing his vision to the screen. It's worth seeing this movie just to witness a genius craftsman pouring his heart and soul out. Mad God is bound to divide audiences with his disturbing content, but personally, I see it as an unfiltered expression of abstract animation that takes bold risks. It's an anti-commercial punk splatter piece that goes places that Hollywood fears treading. The Sea Beast. Captain Crony's adopted son, Jacob, travel the seas hunting monsters for the monarchy. However, the king and queen threaten to replace monster hunters with the navy. So, Jacob proposes a competition between the hunters and the navy. Who can catch the legendary sea beast known as the Red Bluster first? The hunter set off on a voyage to capture the Red Bluster, but Jacob finds out that a bubbly little girl called Maisie has stowed away on the ship. The captain lets her stay, much to Jacob's annoyance. However, when the crew take on the Red Bluster, Maisie and Jacob end up being swallowed by the sea beast. Red takes Maisie and Jacob to an isolated island populated by monsters. Maisie begins to wonder if the beast they been hunting mean no harm, questions the validity of sea creature attack stories, and convinces Jacob that hunting animals like Red is wrong. I've seen some folks compare this film to How to Train Your Dragon. While there are similarities, I think it's dishonest and shallow to call the sea beast a rip-off. There's more than enough differences here. As for the film itself, I freaking loved it. To be fair, it's full of a lot of tropes that I tend to like. From a nautical setting filled with awesome giant monsters, to a himbo tough guy bonding with a cheeky little girl. So, what do you say? Should we give it a go? You mean, uh, you mean like a family? Sure. I don't know. I really loved all the character designs for this movie. Every single one is varied in shape, size, ethnicity and features. It's great to see a film addressing the vast physical range that humans come in. Many underrepresented kids will get to see themselves in this movie. I also like seeing a movie that develops a bond between humans and a monster this size. Red is a massive creature who ominously towers over Jacob and Maisie, to the point where they look like ants climbing on her, yet the film manages to convey this strong connection between both parties. See this little guy? This is you! You're wasting your time! And this is me! And this is him! Are you putting on a puppet show? We're sinking here! We need to get way over there! And I wonder if you might be good enough to take us? The film also raises the excitement quite a lot with its intensely epic action set pieces. I really liked how many different types of fight sequences we got. All in one movie. There's pirates versus sea creature conflicts, badass kaiju battles, and even some swashbuckling sword fighting. This film is a biting deconstruction of the British Empire too, a movie that addresses how not all written colonial texts are inherently true, and that it's important to question the validity of monarchy-approved historic literature. This is just nonsense. Says you. But the book says otherwise, and it's going to outlast both of us. So people will believe the beast destroy towns that don't exist. And hunters like to say ya. Yeah. Plus, the film also tackles how colonists will often use the struggling and desperate working class as pawns in the wars that they create, treating them like tools in a grand scheme that only benefits those in power. The film even leads up to the most powerful image I've seen in an animated movie this year, a little black girl riding a mighty dragon as she stands up to the British Empire face to face and exposes their misdeeds. It's a moment that gave me goosebumps. I come from a long line of hunters that died your great death. Your kingdom was paid for with their blood and their blood. 
Enough! General, give the command! This war was started by the kings and queens what come before. And with every lie, their empire grew. The Sea Beast might not be my number one pick, but it's definitely a very relevant and brave film. Turning Red Mei is a cheery Chinese-Canadian 13-year-old girl with a silly personality. While she's a bit of an outcast, her friends stick by her, and they all share a mutual love for the boy band Four Town. However, Mei really wants to be a good daughter to a stern, overprotective mother, Ming. So she dedicates her life to earning high grades and helps out at a family's temple. One morning, Mei wakes up to realize that she's transformed into a red panda and she has to stay completely calm to remain human. Ming explains that Mei has inherited her ancestor's ability to morph into a red panda beast but a ritual can be performed to end the curse. Meanwhile, Mei and her friends really want to go to a four-town concert, but the tickets are really expensive, so they agree to use Mei's red panda as a gimmick to sell to their schoolmates. They manage to raise enough money for concert tickets, but realize that the gig will be on the same night as Mei's ritual. To make matters worse, Ming finds out about Mei's red panda business, blames Mei's friends for coaxing her, and Mei reluctantly lets them take the blame. On the night of the ritual, though, Mei realizes that she loves her red panda, decides to keep it, and sets off to the Four Town concert to make up with her friends. This deeply angers Ming, who lets out her own red panda, which is revealed to be a giant terrifying monster. What makes Mei's red panda transformation so great is how it could be an abstract metaphor for so many different things. Puberty, repressed feelings, individuality, etc, etc. Director Domi Shi doesn't call to the audience into working out the subtext. Are you sick? Is it a fever? A stomachache? Chills? Constipation? No! Wait. Is it that? Did the did the red peony bloom? No. Maybe. <gasps> now I've never actually been a teenage girl, but I've seen a lot of women explain how accurate turning red is to their experiences growing up. Sure, a vocal minority have been complaining about how cringe these characters act, but guess what? Teenagers are naturally embarrassing. It would be ridiculously unrealistic to pretend that they're cool, confident, and mature by thirteen. Heck, that's the major appeal to turning red, Mei and her friend's unapologetic nerdiness. There's a goofy charm to how free-spirited and dorky they are. The gooey heart of the whole film is the genuine and earnest friendship between these gal pals, who share a sincere bond rooted in healthy, unconditional love. You're our girl. Yeah, no matter what. Panda or no panda. What unites these girls the most is the boy band Four Town. I've always admired how this film is never snobby or cynical to this kind of pop music. Sure, we get a few jokes here and there, but for the most part, the movie is sort of a love letter to boy bands, and Four Town even gets to help out in the finale. I never met nobody like you. Had friends and I've had buddy. It's true. But the main focus of the film is the topic of helicopter parenting. The movie goes out of its way to criticize how this type of mothering is very harmful because it disrespects a child's agency and personal space. It does this by showing how repressed Mae feels thanks to her mum's tyrannical parenting. I never went to concerts. I put my family first. I tried to be a good daughter. Turning Red is a uniquely bold movie that wears its personality and influences on its sleeves, all while tackling serious topics with a mature honesty. I'll admit that I've only had time to talk about this film on a basic level, which is why I do encourage folks to go watch my full review for a deeper dive. Enter Galactic. Based on a Kid Cudi album of the same name, Enter Galactic follows Jabari, a skilled artist who has just been hired to work for the esteemed Cosmic Comics. His new income has also given him the opportunity to move into a new luxury apartment, where he meets his beautiful neighbor, a talented photographer called Meadow. The two of them hit it off and start dating, but their deep insecurities and busy lives challenge their future together. It's a shame that a film this inspired went under the radar this year. Heck, it's almost criminal that it faded in and out of the animation zeitgeist. There's a humbleness to its simplicity that I truly admire. It has no fancy bells or whistles. It's just a sweet and tender romantic story between two creatives. Sometimes that's all you really need for a movie. The chemistry between Jabari and Meadow alone was enough to captivate me. So, you're a photographer? Yeah, I never leave home without her. So. <laughs> what? Uh, it's nothing. I, I actually really like that. The whole men walking curbside thing is the one chivalrous thing I'm into. Why is that? It shows you're willing to die for me. 
Okay. The two of them sharing a kindred passion for creativity while also inspiring each other to become their best selves through respect, love and support. Sure, there's hiccups in their relationship along the way, but only because they're trying to find themselves in a competitive industry. They're attempting to break barriers as artists, while also dealing with personal fears that are affecting their confidence in dating. I also loved how we saw the relationship from both perspectives. We'll go from Meadow chatting to her best friend, asking a guy to lunch, taking him to your favorite restaurant, going for a romantic stroll in the rain, doesn't constitute as a date. I was on a date, huh? You were on a date. Karina. <laughs> then switch to Jabari bantering with his mates. Look, we spent all day together, okay? So when we got home, we just said goodnight and that was it. Not even a goodnight smooch? Dude, she's my neighbor. I just moved into the building. I'm not trying to fuck the vibes up, you know what I mean? Neither side is villainized. They're just human beings trying to get a grip on themselves and what they want. I was especially impressed by how open-minded the film was about female sexuality. Hollywood tends to be prude or snobby about women's needs and desires, but Enter Galactic shows women being unapologetically thirsty for a sex after a date and pleasuring themselves without a man's help. Literally, all I wanted to do was bone. I mean, right there, hanging from the incinerator door, just wild, wet, sloppy, choking. Oh, like right up to the point of losing consciousness. Enter Galactic is also this ethereal and immersive experience that effectively draws you into its grungy world. It uses a cel-shaded comic book art style, reminiscent of Spider-Verse, to portray Manhattan as a bustling city that always feels alive, with fantastical visuals thrown in to convey our characters growing love, or worse, fears. <laughs> Like I said, this film was based on a Kid Cudi album, but it never feels like a vanity project or marketing gimmick, because the storytelling is always coming first. Plus, every track fits perfectly alongside the imagery too, their vaporwave vibes and laid-back rapping serving as the perfect soundtrack for a stoner film. I cannot recommend this adult animated film enough to anyone who has Netflix, because I really want to shine some light on it. Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Geppetto dearly loves his son Carlo, but sadly, Carlo was killed in a bomb strike. Geppetto is stricken with grief and can't move on from the loss of his son. So while on a drunken rampage, he clumsily puts together a puppet boy called Pinocchio and falls asleep. That night, a magical sprite grants Pinocchio life and gives Sebastian J. Cricket the role of guiding the wooden boy in return for a wish. Geppetto is shocked that Pinny is suddenly alive and struggles to raise him in a judgmental town. Pinocchio himself wishes that he could be a better son, so he tries out various jobs, from a circus entertainer to a soldier for Italy's fascist army. Meanwhile, Sebastian and Geppetto have been swallowed up by the giant monstro. I'm sure that many folks expected I'd put this at my number one, but I have no regrets at all for picking the obvious, because this film really has earned its title as the best animated movie of the year. One thing that I admire about it is how Del Toro puts his fingerprints all over it. It takes the classic story and makes it his own. It's this personal touch that helps it stand out from other for Pinocchio adaptations, but the film is also intensely and immensely anti-war. It doesn't beat around the bush about how much it hates war. I'll go to war. It sounds quite fun. I can learn to fight and, and fire a weapon and march like no, this. No, Pinocchio. War is not fun. War is not good. War. War took Carlo away from me. That's not to say that the film simply concludes, war is bad. He uses Penny's adventure to really dissect why it's so awful. Like how soldiers are traumatized into being cold shells, the disgusting disregard for human lives, and the grotesque hatred of individuality in a fascist regime. The latter is at its most profound when we start seeing Pinocchio becoming a literal puppet for propaganda. I fight for the land, I fight overseas. I'll fight up to the end, glory to Italy. At the same time though, the movie is very much about the relationship between a parent and their child. While most adaptations follow the journey of Pinny learning to be a good boy, Del Toro concentrates more on how the world around Pinny is cruel, but he remains innocent and free-spirited, while inspiring adults to be better people. It's down to Geppetto to ignore public perception and learn to love Pinocchio unconditionally. Why are you so blind? So absolutely blind! The boy loves you! He has much to learn! but he loves you for who you are. Would it kill you to do as much for him? I was also very delighted to see Del Toro's trademark quirky sense of humor in the movie. His dry wit and penchant from a carb humor helps the film retain some kind of light heart, all while showing that laughter can be found in even the darkest of worlds. I want to 
play. Please, please, please. Can I play? That part of there, don't you understand, Schmendrick? It's boring in there. Another thing I really appreciated is how the movie explores the yin and yang of immortality. Yeah, there's certainly a bliss and freedom to living forever, but Del Toro also taps into the horrors of eternal life. How you might never die, but everyone you bond and fall in love with will pass away in front of you, which makes Pinocchio's second chance at life more bittersweet than wholesomely uplifting. However, we all know that it's the stop motion that's the star of this film. Del Toro has a genuine respect and passion for this craft that shines through in every frame. He really loves stop motion, bringing his renowned imagination to the boundless space of animation with an ambitious glee. The director even went as far as to not only credit his more experienced co-director, Mark Gustafsson, but also build the animators before the movie star voice cast. Del Toro's Pinocchio has only just been released, but I have a very strong feeling that it's going to become an instant treasure that'll be passed on for generations. So that's my official ranking of all the animated movies that I watched in 2022. Which was your favourite cartoon film last year and why? Let everyone know in the comments below, and don't forget to click that like button. I've been Jambariki, cheerio folks.